Jerry Godreau with Context Scanners, and I'm here with Dan Bennett uh, from Context uh, Global Scanning, as well as Peter Boudreau from the Drafting Clinic Canada, and representatives from National Azon Equipment, the U.S. Context Distributor. Welcome, everyone. Uh, hello, Doyle. Hello, Teresa. Let's see, Dan. I think there was a question that we had emailed uh, in from someone just a couple days ago. Uh, let me see if I can start with that one. Okay. Okay, so uh, he was saying, I'm using an HD5450 to scan engineering drawings in color uh, and uh, and white background, and the white background has a reddish hue in the final image. I've calibrated the scanner, but I still get this reddish color. Gotcha. Okay, the probably the easiest way to to resolve that problem is to set a lower white point setting. Um, the dynamic range of the CCDs is pretty. Uh, pretty large, so it'll often take uh, take a white background document and turn it a slightly pinkish hue, uh, which is fairly normal, and uh, and it's most easily changed by going to your white point settings and just drag the slider bar down a little bit. You'll see the white convert to pure white. I'm sorry, the off white reddish pink color uh, shift back to white, and then that would be your appropriate setting. Uh, there's also uh, an advanced, depending on the version of next image you have, there's an advanced setting in there that you can have it calculated automatically for you, where you just check a auto checkbox and uh, and it will set the, the white point for you automatically based on what it can what it can see. Gotcha. And and I, I've seen something similar, but where the that that background color ends up becoming more of a light blue, is that the same sort of white point setting, or is that a different kind of? Uh, yeah, it's exactly the same same basic uh, issue. And um, as long as you know, there's other things in the scanner. If it's having uh, an actual you know problem itself uh, that can that can cause that same type of thing. But normally, um, for example, if uh, if the document has a certain section, say a 12, 14 inch band running through it, that is much darker, or pinker or bluer than the rest of the document, uh, then that could be an indication that there's a problem on the CCD itself. Um, and that would require, you know, a service call to fix that. But if it's just a slight off and it's only seemingly affecting just the white backgrounds, uh, that's almost 99.9% .9 just a white point setting that needs to be lowered a little bit. Gotcha. Um, so I have a regularly shaped templates for stained glass. When I use auto size, it cuts off some items. How do I ensure all the curves and projections are correctly scanned? Okay, so that that answer would be kind of as a two part answer because uh, there's two things that you need to be uh, concerned about with that. Uh, so auto sizing needs to evaluate where like the leading edge of the document is based on uh, one of two paper sensors in the scanner. So there's one in the center and one off to the right. So when you insert a document, it will uh, detect the leading edge for you. Uh, so that's real critical. And when you have an irregular shaped document, such as these templates, uh, depending on where you put that uh, entry point could have an effect on it. So for example, if it's a large curve, you need to make sure that the very, uh, deepest portion of that curve is triggering the paper sensor first so that you capture all the data. Otherwise it's gonna it's gonna maybe two inches back catch the curve there and cut to that document off. So the paper sensor is important, 
And if it's such a crazy irregular shape that you just can't deal with it at all, there's no no way to put the template in uh, and have it accurately, you know, see the entire the entire document. Then you probably need to put it in a carrier sheet, uh, just a clear acetate film that you can slide it in, and then that way the paper sensor will trigger for the entire document, regardless of the pattern itself. Um, so then the other piece of that is auto sizing uh, is dependent on it being able to do gray tone comparisons to the edges of the document. Because a template like this is an irregular shape, it's not going to be able to do that. So really the best solution for you would be to go to a fixed sheet size, something that's at least the size of the template. So if this is a 30 inch template, then you want to maybe make it uh, at least 31 inches long and, uh, and then wide enough to, to capture, you know, both edges of the template. Uh, and then most likely put it in a carrier sheet to get the whole, the whole thing. Um, it really depends on the shape of the, the object, but the key, the two key ingredients are one, you need to make sure the paper sensor is actually triggering. And number two, that, that you put it in such uh, either a carrier and or you're setting a fixed sheet size wide enough that it can capture all of the information. So it's setting that frame around the entire image, right? Yeah. I guess the shortest answer to that is irregular shaped objects like templates aren't best suited for auto sizing at all. Right. So you're always better using a fixed sheet size of some sort and at least an auto width size, and then make sure you trigger the, you're inserting the document such that the very edge of the template is capturing the paper sensor. Gotcha. And, um, and, and, it, and I, there's a follow-up question to this, but it, it sounds like you really had kind of uh, answered it, but is, is it, what can be done to improve the auto sizing within next image? And it sounds like really that that those are kind of the things, making sure you yeah. <laughs> can keep an eye out on the sensors, where the sensor placement is, you know, making sure you have something framed in the area that, you know, for overall capture, you know, all that kind of thing. Yeah, we really don't have next image doesn't have uh, the algorithm doesn't scan the entire image um, and which is which is difficult to say even on an irregular shaped object, you know, because of the paper sensors. Uh, but I guess the other idea of being able to size that would be to scan the entire document in somehow and then analyze the entire thing and then set the crops to that, those new boundaries. Right. And that's a really uh, slow method <laughs> to do. And, um, and often, you know, isn't really uh, desirable for most productivity right. type environments. And, and, but, oh, sir, go ahead. Yeah, no. So those types of documents, you really are best suited just not to auto size period. So what I was going to say is I think that the easiest and simplest thing that kind of improves our auto sizing is making sure that you only have uh, the paper series selected that you're going to be working with. So where we offer what architectural, ANSI, uh, and ISO, uh, you know, where if you're only working in architectural sizes, CDE, things like that, and you have turned on these European or international sizes where the, the and, you're, and you're working with an odd edged or odd sized document, it, it's going to have maybe more trouble trying to fit that you know, the, the, the right size around the drawing size that you think it would be more as what the software kind of ends up with. Yeah, there's a lot of different options within auto sizing and the way that we, we do an auto size. And uh, we've gotten into this subject a little bit on some of the past webinars, but, but the, um, the basic uh, setting would be auto size to any size, meaning if it's an irregular shape, it's going to try to use gray tone comparisons to identify the paper edges and use the paper sensors to measure the length of the document 
And then it will just size it to whatever that is. Kind of fits in there, right? Yeah. And then we have another feature called any size. So auto size, I'm sorry, auto size to a uh, snap to or to a known paper series. Uh, so that's what you're discussing right there. Right, right. Is you would say, I want to auto size to the standard ANSI. And what it will do then is it will go out calculate what the edges are that it it's located and then it's going to snap the sheet to the closest ANSI sheet size or architectural gotcha whatever that you have selected within the box sure sure and, and, and what uh, you were describing before was you know that that any size feature really finding the the frame the edge of the the physical yeah. piece so. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes documents are really uh, frayed and tattered and torn on the edges and auto sizing really has a difficult time because it, it's using gray tone to figure out where those sheet edges are and it's trying to do it quickly. So we're only looking at the first few inches. Um, let's say you had a document that was kind of trapezoidal in shape. It may, if, if the narrowest section is at the very beginning, then it's going to cut the wider section off at the bottom because it only auto sized to the, the top three inches or so. So we have another feature with the next image as well to say full size scan or full size auto size. And what it will do then is it will scan the entire sheet and calculate the boundaries based on seeing the whole length of the sheet. The problem with that in a productivity environment is now say you're scanning a 24 by 36 inch sheet, it may have to scan all the way down the full 36 inches if it's inserted in portrait mode and to be able to figure out what the dimensions are. So it really slows the scanning speeds down gotcha. because you're, you're taking that extra time and steps. And um, that's why I always, I'm a huge advocate of auto size as a really nice feature if you're doing a lot of one-off scanning. But if you're doing, you're in a productivity environment and you're scanning hundreds of the exact same size sheets, you are always best suited to use a fixed sheet size. Then there's no margin for error. It just is always going to size perfectly and or at least right along. auto size to a known industry standard. Um, and, and again, that, that isn't always 100% perfect because things like dirt and whatnot on the glass can, can force the scanner to make mistakes. Gotcha. But, um, so anyway, that, that kind of gives you the whole, the whole big picture. Right. And then uh, so we had a question in from Russ uh, saying that uh, they recently uh, acquired an IQ Quattro 4450. And he saw in one of our emails that there was a stitching Emerging utility in next image. And can we touch on that feature and its use? So that uh, that is that particular feature is designed around our flatbed scanner. So we have a a C sized uh, flatbed that if you wanted to scan, for example, a D size sheet, then it will do it in multiple passes and then um, merge the two documents into one large document. On a straight IQ 4450, uh, uh, that feature wouldn't be available. And so it's only in the oversized and and that that's a that wizard that triggers in the oversized if you're scanning at the scanner the IQ Flex flatbed, which I have up on a screen right now, has a built-in controller and that oversized stitching wizard will trigger in on the controller or if you're using the next image software on a pc that you're running the scanner with right it's a little wizard that starts and it tells you where to insert the sheet on the flatbed and then it'll scan it'll make a pass and then it'll tell you to reposition the sheet again it makes another pass and then it joins the two two scanned images into one right into okay. one so on a on a wide format that they will have to calibrate and there is stitching in that, right? So he just got this yeah. scanner. Yeah, it's very different 
uh, different technologies and, and they're kind of confused. So we're, we're in essence on the flatbed, we're stitching two images together, but we also have something within all of our wide format roll fed scanners that we call stitching. It's kind of a technical term and it's where we stitch adjacent uh, CIS or CCD modules together. And, uh, and that's done in calibration so that we can have one contiguous line across the width of the scanner. Um, and so we have a vertical height adjustment and a stitching, which is a side to side match for adjacent CCDs. So very, very different than what we're talking about in this feature of, of uh, next image for doing oversized scanning. So we don't have like, for exa example, on your 4450, the scan, the maximum scan width is 44 inches. If you were trying to, to scan something, say 48 inches by 90 inches, number one, you're gonna have one problem. You'll never be able to get that to fit in the scanner anyway, right? Cause it's gonna be longer or wider than 44. Um, it, it doesn't make that feature doesn't make as much sense on a roll fed scanner as it does on a on a flatbed. Gotcha. And and that might actually lead into one of the other questions we had uh, in our email, which is, uh, is a flatbed or sheet fed scanner better at scanning artwork and photos? Uh, I read that a, a camera scanner would give better results and I want the best quality but I'm also concerned about damaging the original. What do we recommend? Okay, well, you can't. <laughs> there was a couple in there. <laughs> yeah, there's several different things within that within that statement. So, and and you caught them all. Uh, so, boy, where do I start? Uh, okay, let's start with artwork and photos protection. <laughs> okay, yeah, a protection of the of the original. That's the number one most beautiful thing of a flatbed because you're not moving the original, it obviously provides the most safety uh, for the document itself because the document never moves. You set it down and the optics are moving instead of, so that, that's one of the huge advantages of flatbed over roll fed. Now the disadvantage is it's a fixed size. You can never make it larger than C size in our particular case with the IQ flex. Um, the other important thing to note is the IQ Flex is a CIS scanner. It is not a CCD scanner. So that was one of the other points within that question. Uh, CCD has a tendency to be uh, a little better at scanning those types of originals um, where you're looking for a more diffused um, more a richer uh, lighting source, that type of thing. Uh, CCDs have traditionally been the best uh, capture technology to use for that. Where CIS, uh, it's it's a little bit. It's kind of like comparing if we could go backwards uh, from a plasma TV to an LED <laughs> TV. So cinematic the plasma always looks a little richer, a little nicer, kind of like a CCD would, would do for, for a scanner. The CIS is a little more like an LED. Uh, today with the LEDs, they've gotten so good that now we have to like compare an OLED versus a regular LED. Gotcha. Um, it's, it's and fast so that would right? be kind of the comparison. <laughs> and because the IQ Flex is a CIS scanner, it's going to be a little... Um, a little more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't want to use the word harsh. Uh, the lighting source is just a little sharper, brighter, more intense, more contrasty than you would see on a, on a CCD. Um, however, uh, I just visited a customer uh, two weeks ago and they scan a lot of photography uh, recreation, and they absolutely love the IQ Flex, and and really probably would stay with it versus moving over to a CCD based scanner, just because they they seem to get the results out of the IQ Flex 
and wouldn't wouldn't want any other solution other than it. Uh, so CIS has gotten very very good, you know, in recent years, and uh, and and you can get very good re- um, mostly because we're we're lighting from two different locations within the sys module, and uh, that puts a more balanced light source onto the uh onto the original and um so anyway <clears throat> artwork especially if you're doing acrylics or mounted uh paintings that type of thing a flatbed really is your best solution because you're not having to to manipulate the the uh the original in any manner you just set it down and scan um, but the only flatbed that we have is CIS based. So at this at this time, it is it is the only solution, and it really does fit a niche in that size as well. So, and that's our scanner that uh, is eighteen by twenty four inch uh, architectural C size glass bed scan area. Uh, but they can do oversize up to 24 by 36 uh, architectural D size with that uh, stitching wizard, you know, or oversized wizard, I should say, right. that automatically right. does that stitches. You know, I think if you if you were shopping for a, a new art scanner, um, it might make a lot of sense to, you know, try to get uh, someplace where you can do a demo on one of these and and scan a few images and just see what kind of quality you can get out of it and and just make sure that that's acceptable for you and um that would be that would be my recommendation before investing into it gotcha and and russ is following up saying thanks uh we occasionally run into documents that are larger than the 44 inch throat width of the scanner and they've been able to scan in sections and do rough stitching with MS Paint. Not ideal, but workable. Yeah, and that, that really, <clears throat> if you're going beyond the 44 inches, that's really your only choice, uh, is to utilize some other third-party software application outside of Next Image to, to merge, stitch those, those multiple images into one. Uh, Probably Photoshop is a, a much better tool uh, than, say, Paint. Um, if it's just engineering documents you're working with, there's a an application called Wise Image that does that type of thing very well, and uh, where you can actually assign even geospatial uh, data to certain points on the document so that when it it, it not only merges them, but it scales them as well. Sure. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Is that yeah. the, you, you know, Wise Image does that nice job where you essentially match one point on the drawing. And then as you match a second point, that point is kind of tipping it in and scaling at the same time. So if there's any size adjustment, as you just kind of push those two points together, it it corrects the whole rest of the drawing. And, yeah. and, and that's great for the large format, the engineering drawings, documents, GIS maps, like you said. But if you're dealing, uh, again, just like you said, if you're dealing with any artwork or anything like that, Adobe Photoshop, where you're able to do a, a nice clean pixel stitch, that that's a fantastic tool for, for getting photos and things like that together that are very large. Yeah, they're really good at blending colors and, and you know, mending yeah adjacent documents <laughs> together yeah that's pretty cool uh and then so we had uh down to our last couple of questions unless anybody has any others but um uh how can i reduce the file size of large maps and cad drawings scanned in high resolution <laughs> okay so again there's never a simple answer to a lot of these questions <laughs> probably the simplest best way to do it uh is use a lossy compression. And what that means is the, the best way to shrink a, a, a large image uh, as far as file size is concerned is to use what they call a lossy file format. And what it will do is take 
it really does a nice tight compression on on the original. And so file formats that use a lossy file format would be ones like JPEG, uh, PDF. PDF actually uses a JPEG compression, uh, those types of things. And, and even within PDF now, they have a lossless uh, file format setting that you can use that doesn't use any compression at all on it. So it does leave a big, even though it's saving as PDF, because PDF has become such a huge um, standard in the industry. Um, but <clears throat> if loss, if a lossy file format is unacceptable, you have to have lossless format. Then the next best solution would be to scan to TIFF. And then within the TIFF algorithm uh, for compression, they have like an LZW or PackBits uh, solution that does a compression on the file, but it doesn't do it in a lossy using the lossy uh, technology or a lossy uh, format to do it. And uh, so you won't get nearly the compression and the file reduction that you would using the lossy format, but you it does do it pretty well. Um, the other solution, and it depends on what it is that you're scanning, but the other solution might be, for example, if you're scanning mapping or just engineering documents, there's very few colors in those types of originals. So if you were to, uh, if you're scanning color and went to an 8-bit uh, color format, so now you're reducing it to less colors, that would be another methodology to use. Uh, and it really shrinks the file down. So for example, if you're scanning a map with 12 colors in it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to scan a 24-bit and produce a scanner a uh, scan with 16.8 million colors in it. You only need 12 colors. The 12 million shades of the red pen. <laughs> yeah. So, so by going down and reducing the amount of colors that you are using, that will give you a tremendous amount of compression. The other thing that that works amazingly along with 8-bit scanning is TIFF LZW because the way that that algorithm compresses a file, it really is fine-tuned to 8-bit scanning where it can take chunks of data that all have the same color and say, from this point to this point, all is going to be that color. And the file really, really reduces. So if you're scanning engineering documents, 8-bit uh, TIFF LZW, if you can't deal with lossy file formats, is probably the best solution for you. Right. And, and what I was going to say before, and then your TIFF is still compliant with different scanning standards for government work, for PDF and TIFF, things like that, and, and you're able to use that LZW. Yeah, often that requirement alone, you know, they'll spec, I, only, I can only have TIFF. And it's probably because they want TIFF uncompressed. And so at that point, 8-bit is your go-to. Um, if they will allow you to add an LZW compression to it, then those two in combination will really get you much, much tighter files. Right. Yeah, because large format TIFF uncompressed can be you know, very large. Yeah, especially if you're scanning at 1200 DPI or some crazy thing. <laughs> right. Uh, so... And then, so I think uh, we'll be getting wrapped up. Our last question was about um, asking about the accounting feature information that is tracked in Next Image Repro specifically. Okay, I'm going to answer one question prior to that because it's related Ooh. to the. They asked, uh, "Can you mention 8-bit is referred to Ooh. as index color in Next Image?" And and that's true. I think that it looks like Peter Boudreau. Thanks, Peter, for that. Uh, yeah, we call it index mode, uh, index color, and it's basically 8-bit or 256 colors max. That's an 8-bit file is limited to, to a total of 256 colors, which surprisingly enough is in the vast majority of uh, mapping or engineering documents is more than enough color to be able to recreate everything that's, you know, that's visible anyway. And, and, you know, and using that color palette, if you were to scan and bring in that palette, that's also a great tool that we offer for uh, blending, removing, uh, you know, merging colors together, doing a, a lot of things like that, right? 
Yeah, I think one of the real powers of index mode or 8-bit scanning is the ability to, uh, let's say you're scanning a map with an ocean. And when you're scanning at 24-bit color, it's going to take that blue, light blue ocean, and it's probably going to recreate it using hundreds of color of shades of blue. And um, when you go to reprint that, often the printer has a hard time, and it and it and it comes out kind of blotchy uh, because it's it's taken different shades of blue and and developed it. And in certain environments, that's exactly what you want. But but often you just want this nice single shade Consistent. solid <laughs> background. And that's where index mode really shines because you can set all of that to a single color of blue. And then when you reprint it, it comes out this nice, even perfect fill color. And um, so, and we have some really good tools with the next image to help either do additive color or subtractive color techniques of uh, being able to visualize the image in full 24-bit color and then apply what we call an LUT or a lookup table of a reduced amount of color. And you can flip back and forth between the two and see if you went too far or not far enough. You need to you know, reduce the colors more. Maybe you went too far and um, you had a road of a certain shade of yellow, but then you had a fill of a certain shade of yellow and it made them the same, you sure. may want to add another shade of yellow in there so that you can differentiate the two areas. Um, those, all of those features are built into the, um, into the next image tool. So it's, right. it's really pretty valuable. I think there's might be an older video up on our YouTube site that shows somebody scanning in kind of a you know, like a background of a ship and then the background, the, the image is kind of yellowing. So they were able to very simply just pick that yellow color and turn that to white and then reprint that image with a nice cleaned up background as well. You know, even if you're yeah. just... <clears throat> and in 24-bit, you know, that's what we... Be, well, actually in 8-bit as well. I mean, but that's that's the whole idea of what a white point setting does as well, is it takes something that is an off shade white is very rarely ever white very subjective <laughs> yeah and and you can look at a piece of paper and go that looks white because in your brain you say that piece of paper is white but when you scan it you find out oh that is really off white it's very gray and when you try to recreate that on a printer it often looks really bad so what you can easily use a white point setting and say anything in that gray spectrum, I want it to be exactly white. And white on an RGB scanner is 255, 255, 255. So right. red, green, blue, all set at white, oh, yeah. which is a value of 255 in, in gray tone. And, um, and, it, and it creates this perfectly white background, which is really attractive. A black point works just opposite. So rarely is black really black. It's usually just a dark, dark gray. And, um, and you can say, no, I want that dark, dark gray to be jet perfect black. Zero, 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 zero for RGB. And, and that's what a black point setting does. And of course, wonderful filters used in moderation. If you go too far, you're going to really see it quick. Um, if you go too far into the uh, into the spectrum of of the colors, that all of a sudden now you got a bunch of things that just turn black on you because you got a little too aggressive with the filter. I was just going to say, and that's a nice point of uh, some of our slider utilities. That you're, you're you're kind of able to make a lot of those adjustments in real time. You know, as, yeah, as that's, goes. that's true. It's it's <clears throat> what you see is what you get basically on the screen. So you've got the image up and you just grab the slider bar and you just drag a little bit to the left and you go, Oh, that looks nice. And you're done. Right. Whereas and, I think uh, in years past, our software, as well as most softwares out there, you would make an image adjustment and then the screen kind of blanks out and then, and then refreshes. 
And you're sort of left wondering, was that when it gets close, it's almost like the optometrist. Is that better, worse, same? Was yeah, that- and moving back even further in history, we were required to then rescan the document to show the results of the filter change that you made. And that was, of course, even slower. So and now with the next image tools, any of those adjustments can be done post scan and it can be saved as if it's just been scanned and, and added to that drawing, right? Right. Another another point, because if you if you do find yourself, you scan 20 documents and you didn't realize that, oh, I didn't quite get the white point right, you can easily just go in without rescanning it, just bring the image up in the next image, set a new white point, save it, and you're done. So you don't have to rescan the whole original again. And that's even after you've maybe uh, processed that image out and, you know, moved it down the line. Now you're getting, you know, hey, we need some changes to that. You can make that change to the original scan virtually without having to rescan that document, right? Right. Yep. And so that last question about the uh, accounting features that are tracked in Next Image Repro. And repeat that one because I was busy reading sure. Peter's comments. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, so uh, they were saying, uh, what is the accounting information that is tracked by Next Image Repro or Next Image 5 Repro? Okay. I have to think about this for a minute. So I think it's, it, we have square footage, right, of this of the scans and the, and the prints, right? It, yeah. So it keeps track of, just about everything that you can think that it would keep track of. So it keeps track of the file name, the date and time stamp, the file size, the dimensional size of the sheet, uh, how long, I think there's a a time stamp for how long it took to scan that, if I remember correctly. It will keep track of the file path where it was saved it will keep track of what type of file format that was used when it was saved, the total image size when it was saved. Uh, it will keep track of the operator. So if you're in a domain environment and you have different operators that are using uh, the scanner, it will keep track of the operator's name uh, that, that was logged into the computer when they, when they uh, scan the image. Um, and it does that both for for saved to uh, uh, scan a file scan and the print, right? <laughs> as well as if you're doing copies, it will keep track of that whole copy count as well and all the data associated with that. And uh, so it really keeps track of just about everything that you need. It saves it all into a database that can be exported into uh, comma separated file csv right csv uh then you can import that into excel it can be imported into any of the edm solutions out there facilities management programs that type of thing that are trying to track usage and for particular operators or a project that type of thing gotcha. oh and that's another key ingredient for productivity is- and efficiency and things right yeah the whole accounting system is set up around a project based type solution. So when you enable it, you can say, I want this to be assigned to a new project. Here's the project number. And then everything that is in that batch of scans will be tracked to that project. Then if you go to a different project, you can use a different project number and all the scans associated to that one will be tracked separately. But then if you have a couple extras, you can always go in, oh, I want, you know, project A instead of project B to track this and it can it can even request every single time you put a document in a scanner what account you want it to be saved to, gotcha. um, which is not a high productivity tool. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, it sounds like if this is a uh, an option that's being used in a reprographic shop environment and whatever the calculation you need to make for the input, the scanning end or the large format scanning to print scanning, copying in. You can get that together uh, for however you might want to build that out. And then if you're using these types of tools for uh, scan projects and productivity and see how you can get, you know, one operator moving 
you know, to the efficiency of some other operators, you know, that that's also some great tools. It can be, it's a yeah. great way to use super, it. Super, super useful. And, you know, like you said, in a repro environment, uh, when you're making copies, uh, the natural tendency is to lean towards, well, how many square feet am I printing? But this will help you track just how much time was spent on the input side and, uh, you know, how much time was spent scanning as well as how much time was scanned was right. spent printing as well as how much you know paper was used and that type of thing so and and, and, and kind of going back to the productivity thing and you know seeing the in between the lines if you know it's supposed to be you know take you know a continuous project and you can see how much time in between each scan then you know that these could be difficult drawings to be somebody's dealing with, you know, and the amount of time prep work, getting everything ready and basically getting that image up to the scanner. And, and, and that's the kind of information that needs to be added to the bottom line for a project that's being quoted out as well. All right. Yep. Lots of data is stored <laughs> in those, those files. It's all good stuff. Well, uh, okay. I think that's our last question. Unless anybody has another one, you're welcome to go ahead and ask or, or text it in, but uh, if not, uh, you're also welcome to go ahead and email us uh, any questions, and you'll probably be getting a um, uh, you know a follow up from this meeting and an invitation to the next one. So if you have any questions to submit, please let us know. And I'll thank everyone very much for your time today. Have a great day. <music>